Okay, we've seen the box map as an example of an outlier map. So there are other examples that we'll see in the lab. For example, a percentile map is one that focuses on the upper percentile and the lower percentile as uh, special observations. What I'd like to do now is just quickly show you some examples of what I mean by these special maps, these maps augmented with other devices. And we'll focus on three in particular, uh, cartogram, conditional maps, and then map animation or a map movie. The cartogram is a fairly um, old device. And um, one of the readings that I included, I didn't put it as a reading, but one of the references that I included is a, a review article by Waldo Tobler uh, a history of the cartogram and it's very interesting it has several historical examples of old ca cartograms and then it also talks in, into goes into some technical detail on some of the computer science aspects of how you construct these cartograms now what's the idea here the idea is that a standard choropleth map the unit the spatial unit of observation is shown as a polygon, right? And the area of that polygon is the size of the unit that you see. Now the connotation of this is that bigger is better, right? Bigger is more important, which may not be the case for the variable you're looking at. And an example I always use is a homicide rates by county in the US. If you make a map of all the counties in the US, and you can do this in the lab on Thursday, and you look at the homicide rate, um, well, just um, which are the places with the highest homicides in the US? Do you have any idea? St. Louis. Pardon? St. Louis. St. Louis. Any other ones? Washington. Yeah. New Orleans. Okay. Try finding those on a county map for the US. St. Louis is a tiny little dot New Orleans is tiny. Detroit, same thing. What you do see is these huge counties in Nevada and Arizona and California, they get all your attention. So the unit with which the information is presented detracts from the information that you like to present. What you would like to have happen with a map like that is that you actually find the places with the highest homicide. Well, you'll never find it on a county map like that. So to fix this, we change the thing that portrays the unit of observation. We change that from being the area to something else. And the something else is the variable that we're interested in. So instead of having area as the size of the polygon, we'll have, say, crime as a size of the polygon. So then St. Louis will be a huge area, quote unquote, and so will New Orleans and so on. Now how do we do this? We have to pick the kind of shape that we use and we have to pick an algorithm so that the arrangements of these areas, because they no longer fit nicely together the way counties do. So we have to fit a, figure out a way to get them as close as possible to their original arrangement in space. So that uh, St. Louis is actually next to East St. Louis and not next to Detroit. Okay, so we have to make sure that this happens. And this is the um, challenge of building a cartogram is to, um, the first principle is that the area reflects the magnitude of the variable of interest. The second principle is that we respect the original topology, what we call topology, which is the spatial arrangement, as much as possible. Now this is a nonlinear problem. There is no unique solution. There are lots of iterative solutions that try to get better at each iteration. The um, specific type of cartogram that we have implemented in Geoda is referred to as a circular cartogram because a circle is used to reflect the magnitude of the variable. You have also cartograms that use rectangles, and you have cartograms that warp or morph 
the shape of the area to try to uh, stay as close as possible to the original topology. So then, if we go back to our um, election results, these tiny little wards, which are some of the highest percentages of the vote, now become circles, larger circles. And I, um, the yellow ones are highlighted. It's, it's kind of hard to see on this projection, but they are selected. We'll talk about selection in a minute. That means that if you click on these, you can also see them as hashed in the map. And this illustrates the whole point of this exercise. On the map, the original map, these are tiny little wards. You can hardly see them. In the cartogram, they are big circles. What we try to is that when two wards are next to each other on the real map, there are also circles that are next to each other in the cartogram. So the cartogram approximates the original layout as much as possible, but has the variable of interest as the size of the circle. So the smaller circles have lower votes, the larger circles have higher percentage of the vote. Um, and we'll, in, in the lab, we'll try this out for um, a number of different applications. Now, when is this useful? When is this not useful? It's useful when the, the size is really misleading, as in our crime example. It's not so useful when the arrangement of the circles, as the case is here, is not informative, and you re really don't know where they are. Now, there are some examples in the literature of cartograms for the UK, and you can more or less you know, deduce the shape of the United Kingdom from the circles that are there. But in this case, if you don't know the area, you have no clue where these places are. So that's why we implement it in Geoda by means of linking. And we'll talk about linking in a few minutes, which is a way of connecting two graphs. So then we can actually see by clicking on one of these circles, a big one, where in fact it is on the map that we relate to, and, and vice versa. Would it be a cartogram if it was three-dimensional? I've seen some maps before that might show United States that are three-dimensional, maybe say homicides by counties, and then they have these peaks, and the peaks, depending on the height of the peaks, show. Yeah, that is not a cartogram. That would be a statistical map. So it's, it's like a symbol map, mm -hmm. where your bar or your peak is a symbol that you add. Uh, in fact, I saw a real, um, there's a, some very innovative combinations of graphs. If you ever see USA Today has often very creative graphs in, in the background where if you look at them very carefully, they kind of try to summarize multiple dimensions in, in flat 2D. So you see these, bar, for example, for stock market, you see the laggards and the leaders and the ones that changed within the last week and the last month, and they're all different symbols on, on the same graph. Sometimes you see similar things on a map. So that, those are symbol maps where you use the, 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 the spike or the bar or a pie chart or something to correct the same problem. So it, they, these kinds of maps address the same problem, namely that area as such is misleading. So the cartogram actually changes the area the symbolic maps don't. They leave the area there, and they just put another piece of information on top of it. Um, this relates back to some of the things I said about Tufti and his guidelines. Once you go into three dimensions, you have to be very careful, because depth adds additional information, which could be misleading, and in the sense that it could make things seem more important that really shouldn't be more important, because they're closer in the 3D. Than, than others. The second category of statistical maps that I wanted to spend a little bit of, of time on is what uh, are called conditional maps. And conditional maps are a special case of a conditional plot. Anybody here familiar with a trellis graph? No? Nobody's worked with S plus or anything like that? A conditional plot is um, a way to show interaction between multiple variables. Say you're interested in the connection between um, income and 
expenditures for a particular product. Okay, so you have a simple, say, scatter plot where you have income and expenditures. Now let's say there's a third variable that might be of interest. Let's just keep it simple and let's say it is religion. Okay. And religion is categorical. You have two religions. Let's keep it very simple. So now instead of lumping everything together in one graph, you make two graphs. One income and expenditure for one religion and one income and expenditure for the other religion. And you see whether these two graphs are the same. Same slope, etc. This is conditioning on the third variable. The third variable in this case being religion. And we have two categories. We condition on these categories in that we make separate graphs for each condition. You can also do this with a continuous variable. Let's say we had some kind of you know, political score for these households. And the score goes from 0 to 100. And you cut it at 20, then 20 to 60, and 60 to 100. We're conditioning on our score. We have three graphs now. One for each of these intervals. So the observations in those graphs are those that satisfy the condition on the third variable. And you can go further than this and condition on two variables and then show a graph. And this is what the conditional map is a special case of. Um, we're going to condition on two variables. These are two dimensions. And then we're going to make multiple maps. And in the literature, these are some call, sometimes called micro maps because they tend to be like thumbnails. They are much smaller than a regular map and as a result cannot show as much detail. So they're really there to, teach you, to be used in analysis, not for presentation purposes. Think of two variables. Right? And I'll give you an example in a second of uh, smoking and cancer. And the two variables, one is smoking and the other one is socioeconomic status. So smoking, we cut it in three categories. No smokers, medium, high smokers. Social economic status, same thing, three categories, low, middle, high. That gives us nine combinations, right? nine subgroups of the original observations that satisfy these two criteria. Then for each of these nine cells, if you wish, in a matrix, we're going to be making a map of lung cancer rates. The idea is that if there is no interaction between SES and smoking and lung cancer rates, then these maps should be random maps. But if there is an association, say low income, high smokers get more cancer, then you should see that on the map, in that it would have higher cancer rates for that little box that you picked on the conditioning variable. So that's the rationale. So we take two variables that we think have something to do with a third variable, we condition on the two variables and then see if the map for the third variable shows any kind of systematic pattern. And this is the illustration I had in mind. On the horizontal axis, we have percent smokers. So um, these are the low smokers, these are the high smokers. So these three maps here are all three for low smokers, middle smokers, high smokers. And then on the vertical axis, we have socioeconomic status. So low, medium, high. So who are these people? No smoking, high SES. Who are these people? The reverse, right? Are these the same maps? No. This suggests, suggests, doesn't prove anything, that there might be a correlation between smoking, SES, and cancer incidence. If there were not none, then these would be totally random maps. Okay. The other example I have makes it a little simpler in that um, we're conditioning on, on east, west, and north, south. So you can see very clearly what is going on here. All these um, you know, you can think of 
a grid being superimposed on the map. The conditioning is, is direct is the, the, the dimensions. So here we have the closest ones. We're moving out um, on the x-axis further away to the east and further away to the east. And here we're moving north. So this is northwest. This is southeast. And then in each of these maps, we make a little micro map of the electoral results. And if election results were uncorrelated with place, all these maps should be more or less the same. Now what we see is that the browns tend to be on this side and the greens tend to be on the other side. You know, west for the browns, east for the greens, which again suggests that there may be some kind of spatial stratification in terms of the votes. And it's the same example we've already seen before. We already know, I mean we don't really know, we suspect there is spatial stratification. And this is yet another way to get at the same suggestion that this is not spatially random. These votes happen spatially structured in the city. Now, of course, that doesn't explain anything, but it tells us this is something to focus on. Why is it that these votes are different in different parts of the city? Are the people different in different parts of the city, et cetera, et cetera? That is part of the exploratory uh, <coughs> exercise. So. We have the cartogram, deals with the misleading effect of area. Conditional maps deal with multivariate interaction. Remember the importance of multivariate interaction. This is one way, and I think a very powerful way, to look at the interaction between three variables on a flat 2D map. And you'll see that a lot of the devices that we look at are ways of getting multivariate information down to 2D, which is what we can handle. And then the third example that I'd like to highlight here is map animation. Is animation is a very powerful tool to again bring another dimension into the comparison. Um, what we'll look at here is a very simple device that essentially walks through the observations from lowest to highest. And in the new Geoda, we actually have a bivariate version of this where you have two variables next to each other and you walk through them from low to high so then you can see quote unquote whether they show similar patterns whether the lows for one variable are also in the same position as the lows for another variable it's it's very simple and it's the same rationale if things were really spatially random then you would see kind of a scattershot approach as you fill up this map. But when they're not, you see systematic patterns that may be core first, periphery later, east first, west later, north first, south later, etc. Et and what I'd like to show you is a, a, a little example of um, a simulation of the map movie. And see, we clicked on the play button and you see the values being filled out. We can pause it. If you look at this map, this is highly unlikely to be a random process. There is structure here. And then with the map movie, as you'll see in the lab, you can do this by hand. You can step forward, step backwards, or you can see kind of how this pattern gets structured throughout. And so what we see is a very almost too systematic patterning as you go from low votes for this particular party to high votes. As you, uh, if you remember, the last ones to be picked out were the ones in the very core. That's where that party got the highest votes. At the periphery, we saw the low votes for that particular party. So here again, the purpose is to dismiss randomness and to get us focused on patterns. 